Welcome. Today on AI Adventures, we're joined in the studio by Justin Zhao, a Google research engineer. Hey, Justin. Hi. Thanks for joining <laughs> in the studio today. Yeah, it's great to be here. We're going to be talking today about natural language interfaces and uh, how computers and humans can talk to each other in ways that are natural and not awkward. Yep, sounds good. <laughs> awesome. So I want to start by talking a little bit about your team's area of research and kind of the general natural language processing field. And then we'll delve into your area of research and see where our conversation takes us. Yeah, that sounds great. So broadly speaking, um, the area of my research is uh, natural language processing, or NLP. Okay. And what that is, NLP is all about um, trying to understand how humans communicate with each other and how to get a computer to kind of replicate that behavior so that we can interact with computers in a more natural manner. Wow. You guys really picked a small field to target there. <laughs> Yeah, NLP sounds super broad. Yeah. It's like everything. Yeah, it's pretty broad. Um, so in fact, like I have some slides that we can pull up. Um, yeah, just that'd to be, focus it a little that'd bit. be great, yeah. Um, yeah, so first I think it'd be, it's important to talk about the conversational user interface. Mm -hmm. And for something like the Google Assistant, there's two big domains of NLP problems that come into play. On one side, you have the problem of understanding which is, what did the user say? What was the user's intent? And on the other side, you have the problem of generation, which was, uh, what should we say to the user? And how do we respond in a way that's intelligent and conversational? Right, that makes sense. So I work on the generation side. And the ultimate goal of natural language generation is to teach computers to turn some kind of structured data into natural language, which we can use to respond to the user in a conversation. Wonderful. And this is definitely something that I feel like Conventionally, NLP has really been broadly thought about as a field where it's all about processing the words and mm -hmm. understanding what text means. Mm -hmm. But you are working on the generation side, which in a lot of ways often gets overlooked. And so it's really great that you're able to kind of tell us more about this side of things. Yeah, mm, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you then teach a computer to generate natural language rather than just understand it? Right. So uh, for now, let's set aside the structured data you know, part of natural language generation. Sure. And we can focus on the natural part mm -hmm. of the natural language generation. So what makes a conversation like the one we're having uh -huh. feel human? Speaking of the one we're having, it's a little <laughs> meta that we're having a conversation about what makes something conversational. So that's a common remark on our team. Yeah, we have to <laughs> not be too robotic in our conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this breaks down into two kinds of requirements. Okay. Um, first of all, the content of what we have to say has to make sense in the context of the conversation. Right. So is what I'm saying an appropriate response to what you're saying? Uh, does, or is it out of the blue? Hey, what are you having for dinner? <laughs> so That's kind of out of the blue. <laughs> that's kind of out of the blue. So, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, exactly. And then I have to think about if what I'm going to say is actually going to answer your question. Mm -hmm. So if you were going to ask me where we want to go for dinner, um, it would be weird to to, to suggest like a coffee shop or a clothing store. Right. Yeah. Yeah, unless you really wanted to get some coffee stains on your clothes <laughs> for dinner. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> the second requirement is that you actually have to use the language correctly. Mm -hmm. So this is like, you know, how's my grammar? Do my verbs agree? Or, you know, if I'm using a pronoun, is it ambiguous? That makes sense. So it's basically, you know, what do you say? And then how do you say it? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And you also mentioned earlier there's this structured data that we, we kind of put aside. Mm -hmm. Where does that come into play? That's a great question. So structured data primarily helps us figure out the first requirement, which is what we want to say. Um, for example, if let's say a user asked us about the weather next week in Santa Clara. In Google search results, we see a box filled with all this information about the weather for the next week. Okay. And somewhere within this data, hopefully, answers the user's question. And we just have to figure out how to turn all this data into a response to the user. Uh, that's kind of the problem that we're focusing on in natural right. language generation. And, and that's because we're talking about a situation where we're going to say our answers, not just show them the box to look at. That's correct. Okay, exactly. so it's like an audio interface. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. right. And in that case, I guess I can imagine a sort of naive solution for this sort of problem. We already have the data, right? Yeah. So, but I, I don't know if it would be sufficient. Well, you know, that depends. Uh, by all means, go for it. All right. So let's say we make some kind of a template, right? And we can say, 
uh, you know, on blank day, it'll be blank temperature and then some blank weather condition. Like on Tuesday, it'll be 72 degrees and partly cloudy. And then you could build a full forecast by just iterating through all the days of the week like that. So I will say that that is a very straightforward approach and some assistants do use that implementation. However, in practice, it's a lot less conversational than you might think. Uh -huh. um, so how about you try asking me what's the weather like this week and then I'll use your algorithm to generate a response. All right, sounds good. We'll call this the, the Justin assistant. So, perfect. Right. <laughs> okay, Justin, what's the weather like next week? Hi, Yufeng. Um, Sunday, it'll be 66 degrees and partly cloudy. Monday, it'll be 63 degrees and cloudy. Tuesday, it'll be 66 degrees and partly cloudy. Wednesday, it'll be 68 degrees and cloudy. Oh boy, Thursday. okay, yeah, that's <laughs> getting too long and just too robotic. Yeah, um, yeah okay. let, let's, let's call it, let's call it at that. Yeah, e even saying it for me felt a little strange. <laughs> yeah. So clearly generating natural language from structured data is non-trivial. Mm -hmm. How would you actually go about using a computer system to answer the user's question then? Well, first, you know, I would want to think about how I'd answer it as a human. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a human, I would hope that I'd be a little more contextually aware. And I would realize that there's actually a lot of repetitive information in the mm -hmm. data. So I'd probably try to summarize it. Something uh -huh. like, um, it'll be cloudy until Thursday with showers the rest of the week. Uh, temperatures range from the high 40s to the mid 60s. Hey. You might want to consider a career as a weather forecaster <laughs> if you know this whole research thing doesn't work out. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've done a little bit of an overview of natural language generation mm -hmm. uh, about what makes conversation natural. And we even gave kind of an admittedly silly example of leveraging this structured data to select content for a natural language response. Yeah, and we've also yeah. included some links uh, with more info in the video. That's right, that we have. All right, so then getting back to the topic at hand, how, how does machine learning then get involved? Well, that's the ultimate question that our team is trying to answer. Okay. Without machine learning, everything that we've talked about so far, from parsing the data to figure out what to say, to actually figuring out how to say it, um, the, it ha you have to do this with writing lots of rules. And rules are great. Uh, they're very stable, they're very predictable. Um, but they're usually very specific, and they require a lot of engineering. And because of that, uh, it's not really scalable to new inputs and outputs. For example, if we wanted to talk about finance instead of weather, uh -huh. or if we wanted to support an entire new language altogether, sure. it would require writing a whole new set of rules. Yeah, and it sounds like that would be way harder to maintain as well, keeping all those rules lined up as, as things change. Mm -hmm. And it would also be hard to replicate that uh, creativity and spontaneity that comes with human conversation. Right. So that's exactly one of the motivations of our research. Okay. Um, our hope is that by giving the model examples of data and the language it needs to generate, uh, we can let the model form its own rules uh, about what to do. And not only does this save us from having to write these rules ourselves by hand, uh, but it also gives the computer more free reign to be creative in its own way. So showing many examples to answer questions, you might say, so that you can write fewer rules. I mean, that's kind of the crux of machine learning as a whole. That's yeah, wonderful. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, and so what kind of machine learning architectures then are you guys exploring to try to tackle this problem? Well, so far, we've seen really promising results with recurrent neural networks. Um, but that's just one kind of neural architecture that we're exploring. OK. Recurrent neural networks. So on, on our previous episode, we looked at deep neural networks on the show. And uh, that had you know, neurons connected in layers, resulting in something kind of a, a lattice structure. Mm -hmm. right? And for our viewers, can you explain what it means to have a recurrent neural network? Yeah, so you can kind of think of a recurrent neural network as a deep neural network, uh, but just wrapped in a for loop. And the network is recurrent because the outputs of the network feed back into itself. And instead of this kind of one shot, you know, input, output, the model can kind of make decisions over several time steps. OK, awesome. That's a really great way to kind of conceptualize it. Really love that. And we've also included some links about recurrent neural networks down below. And if you have more questions about this uh, kind of network structure, feel free to leave them below in the comments, and we'll try to get to them. Mm -hmm. For now, we'll talk about why recurrent neural networks uh, will be useful for doing natural language generation. 
Right, so it's important to keep in mind that language, just mm -hmm. in general, is extremely sequential. Sure, yeah. For example, um, the cat sat on the mat is a very different sentence from cat sat the mat on. Yeah, order matters. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. So uh, RNNs are especially good at remembering what it kind of saw earlier because it enforces a sequential policy over the data. Um, the inputs are decided in a very ordered manner and instead of in these kind of large conglomerates. Okay. So I guess it's both amazing and not entirely surprising that uh, recurrent neural nets would be useful for natural language problems, it sounds like. As humans, we rely a lot on what we previously said to figure out what we'll say next. Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk a bit more then on how you're using these recurrent neural nets to generate this language. So one kind of fun variation when it comes to recurrent neural nets mm -hmm. is that since the output is generated one step at a time, right. you can kind of choose the granularity of your output. Uh, so some models can choose coarser outputs, like entire word phrases or oh, just wow. words in okay. general. Uh, and then this goes all the way down to models that outputs like bytes, single bytes at a time. One byte at a time, okay. And uh, for us, the, we're, we've been using outputs at the character level. Ah, okay, so you're like spelling out the words, really. Right, okay. right. And this kind of model is called a, is a character-based RNN, and you can find out more information in the links below. So when we first talked about having you on the show, you showed me this uh, interesting graph here. Right. <laughs> I would love to understand it a little better. What is it showing us exactly? So this is a small visualization of our recent research. Mm -hmm. um, each row here represents different pieces of our structured data. Gotcha. The shading of the squares indicates how much the model actually cares about that piece of structured data. And lastly, each column represents a single step in our model. So as we travel across the columns, you can see how the model has learned to pay attention to the structured data at different time steps. Ah, OK. So we're kind of traveling left to right, character by character, mm -hmm. for each column. And so the lit portions, the lighter parts, are right. the parts that the model is paying attention to. Right, exactly. OK. And then on this model over here, for example, it means the model is paying attention to this bit to decide what character to output. It's not saying that that's the character it'll say. It'll just That's just the data it's looking at? Right, exactly. Okay. So it's going to look at that particular piece of data uh, to try to think figure about out what, to, to what character to output. Uh, exactly. Right. Um, and then one really cool result is this diagonal line in yeah, the middle. About that. It's kind of formulaic. It almost looks like you guys added that in afterwards to yeah. make, make, make for something interesting. It's like hard-coded. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, those particular pieces of data are basically the characters for a specific location. And what that diagonal line is showing us mm -hmm. is that when the model has reached the part of the sentence where it wants to spell out the specific location, it's learned to read that from the data, character by character. Wow. That is, that is awesome. <laughs> and, and no one taught the model to do that. They were just able to learn it, how to do that just by looking at examples. Exactly. That's the magic of Incredible. it. Incredible. That's, that's super outstanding. Yeah. So um, the diagonal line is pretty cool, mm -hmm. but if you dive into our data, there's actually a lot of other intriguing ways that the model kind of learns by itself how to reference the data to decide what character to output. Um, so you know that said, there's still a ton to explore, uh, but I'm super excited to see what you know what we come up with in the future and how far we can push our research. This looks super cool, Justin, and I'm really excited to hear about what your team comes up with next. Maybe uh, maybe you'll write a research paper using one of these networks in the future, yeah? <laughs> that sounds pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. Justin, I want to thank you so much for coming into the studio today and teaching our viewers about natural language generation. Mm. Looking forward to catching up again in a minute. I'm going to wrap up here. Yeah, OK, sounds good. It was my pleasure. All right, sweet. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of AI Adventures. I certainly did. In our conversation, we talked about using machine learning for natural language generation and its role in conversational user interfaces. I had a blast chatting with Justin, and if you like this format, please let us know in the comments below. And for more information and details about everything that we talked about, we've included tons of links in the description. And be sure to subscribe to the channel to catch future episodes and maybe some more interviews as they come out. <laughs>